Hello, everyone. My name is Katie Ross. I'm the Education Director of Liberal Studies here at Full Sail University, and I'm excited to spend the next hour with all of you to learn about getting noticed without connections with our 2019 Hall of Famer, Thela Davis. So without further ado, I'm truly honored to give you guys, present to you Thela Davis, who if I am understanding your story correctly, and if I remember it from Hall of Fame at the inductee ceremony, you were noticed through LinkedIn Messenger. So I really couldn't have a better panelist here today yes. to chat with our students. <laughs> yes, that in fact did happen. Um, uh, hello, everyone. <laughs> Thank you for uh, check, coming to check out my presentation. Uh, I feel very passionate about it uh, because I didn't know anybody getting into entertainment. My uncle didn't do it. <laughs> you know, no cousins in A&R. It was just like, how do I get into this thing that I'm so passionate about? Um, and what are the tips and tricks that I kind of went through in these past 18 years since leaving uh, Full sale? So, um, yeah. Uh, I guess I'll start from the beginning um, with how the internet uh, first, it, it was Brad Floyd at at a full sale who told me to get on LinkedIn, and I was like, ah, okay, um, that works for some people, uh, <laughs> or uh, actually nobody, because I mean it was kind of like a laughable thing, um, and this was like like almost ten years ago, and then uh, it still took me like two years to really get my profile. Um, but, and, and really, when I started to get my profile together, I just looked at other engineers uh, that I admired. And I noticed that, you know, they would have all their credits and they had pictures and they had like proof of what they did. And uh, at the time, uh, LinkedIn had just started uh, letting people put their um, their audio and their their actual multimedia content. Um, on LinkedIn because it was just text-based until about eight years ago. Um, and as soon as they started doing it, I was like, you know, I'm going to start putting up some mixes and like showing all the places I've worked in New York. Uh, and I was just building it up. Like, and after like eight months of posting, um, and, and at this time I was mixing a lot, like, six, seven nights a week in between New York City um, or, or Brooklyn. Oh, and by the way, I, I'm at my, my podcast studio, which is what I'm into now. <laughs> Long story short, we'll get into that a little later. But uh, in Fort Lee, New Jersey. So uh, I've been here for the past 11 years. Um, but, you know, getting your foot in the door in such a big city is always the problem. Like, how do you get ahead or What's that little edge that you could do that nobody else is doing yet? And I, you know, I just kind of took advantage of LinkedIn's new uh, video uploading, you know, and the fact that you could put your own stuff up there. Uh, and like after eight or nine months of doing that, uh, I also realized that analytically, uh, LinkedIn, they ranked people. So and and they ranked it by how much content you put into LinkedIn. So I, I was like, oh, if I keep putting in more and more videos, it I, I could see where I was ranking in New York City audio engineers. Um, so after a while, I actually made it to number one because I had so much content. I had my pictures up. I had video. Uh, and and don't get it twisted. It was nothing high tech about my video or, or uh, the mixes that I was posting. Actually, it wasn't even video. I was just taking a two track from my $250 at the time H4 um, Zoom. And I just started posting those to YouTube and then posting that link to LinkedIn. I uh, was doing that for almost a year, and then I got a random uh, direct message from six-time Grammy Award winner Christian McBride, who's a, a jazz bassist, um, and he's worked with everybody 
you can think of from Quincy Jones to Paul McCartney to, I mean, he's just played with, I mean, all, all the masters. So um, I, I was found and, you know, the biggest gig I got was was through putting out these mixes of, of bands that nobody really knew, but just putting myself out there and, and realizing analytics do matter. You know, it's, it's like, where are you when people just look for New York City audio engineer or game designer, whatever city you're in? So, you know, um, taking advantage of that, those little edges because you never know who's looking and when. So that for me was like the the that was when I finally started to go out on tour. And mind you, I was out of full sale for about 12 years by then. So, uh, you know, I was 30 by the time I really started going out. And over these past seven years, I, I've been on about every continent, <laughs> been to, you know, Africa, Asia, Europe, uh, New Zealand, Austria, Australia. <laughs> uh, it, it's taken me around the world just putting out what I was doing already. So, you know, that, that was how that life-changing thing happened for me. So, um, and then I guess my other thing about getting noticed, um, once I graduated from Full Sail, I had to go back home to my small town in uh, in Sherrall, South Carolina, which is hometown of Dizzy Gillespie, but uh, <laughs> it's a very small town, and and we didn't have any theater programs or anything like that. So, wanting to be an audio engineer, and I, I couldn't really go back home because my mom didn't like live in New Jersey or you know in New York City or or Cali or somewhere like that. That it was a, li- a little easier access uh, to the type of work that I did. So having to go back there and kind of like saving up money and doing what you need to do. Um, and, and that's again, why I wanted to do this presentation is like, no matter where you're at, just start from there and take small steps every day. Uh, how do you eat an elephant one bite at a time? <laughs> you know, so uh, one, you know, one bite every day. So, the, the, and that's how I, I built my career. It's just, you know, I did something towards it every day, uh, whether it was reading a magazine or finding out, you know, what's the latest piece of gear out, like always getting better at, at what you're doing um, was always my thought process from leaving um, Full sale. So going back home and having to work all the crappy jobs from folding airbags to cutting, cut, deboning chickens in a chicken plant, because I mean, we're in the South. So, you know, <laughs> uh, do, doing all of these things after going to full sale and you're like, wow, I spent, you know, I did all of this and I'm back here in this town. But it's like, all right, but that's where I have to start. I have to start eating that elephant of where I wanted to take my career from there. Okay, so what do I need to do next? I need to get enough money to get out of this town. So for a year, I didn't do anything. I went back home, but nobody would have ever known from who I went to high school with or anything because I just went home, saved all my money. And the other thing about South Carolina is a, it's a very seasonal place. So when it's not summertime, there's no tourists there. So uh, places like Myrtle Beach, South Carolina, and, and like Charlotte, their amphitheaters and stuff like that would just dry up during the winter time. So there was so little work for what I got into initially, which was live sound. Uh, so going from, you know, trying to find work in those different cities. I finally found work in Myrtle Beach, South Carolina. So from there, I started working as a spotlight operator. Oh, actually, no. First, yeah, spotlight operator and stagehand at House of Blues, Myrtle Beach. Uh, For that gig, while I was doing all those crappy gigs for that first year or so out of full sale, um, I would, you know, every month I was 
uh, emailing the production manager at House of Blues. Like, hey, I know, you know, it's not season yet, but please keep me in mind when something opens up in the summertime. And it's like, okay, okay. And, you know, ended up making that happen. Um, And that was like my first real gig out of full sale. And that that took about a a year almost. Um, But it was, it was great, you know, because you'd see all these great shows, uh, heart, <laughs> um, poison to Snoop Dogg. So, you know, you know, House of Blues has so many great different, you know, genres rolling through and just, you know, getting to see how all the different crews did what. And just, you know, that next level out of getting out of school and like getting paid to be there, <laughs> moving boxes, you know, doing all the menial stuff. Because I mean, of course, when you first get out of school, the first couple of years, I, you don't expect to, you know, get behind a, a console usually. Sometimes, you know, hey, it works out for people. Um, but for me, it was just like going through every stage. I did my, my stage hand staged there for a few years. Then I ended up working and uh, at a CBS news station um, affiliate and ESPN radio. So everywhere in Myrtle Beach that had a soundboard, <laughs> um, I was there. And, and um, so that's, you know, always thinking of, you know, what is even near to what you want to do. <laughs> and, and, and uh, making a living out of it and also learning. I mean, that ESPN radio experience, you know, fast forward, uh, you know, 15 years later and I have my own podcast studio and now we're, we're cutting uh, commercials and doing the stuff that I was doing at the radio station. But now for a, a you know, a studio that I now own. Um, so yeah. So Taking, you know, taking bits everywhere you go. And then I ended up uh, moving from South Carolina. Finally, I moved out to Miami for four years. Uh, Worked at a ton of South Florida venues, uh, Parker Playhouse in Fort Lauderdale, Revolution in Fort Lauderdale, freelance with every company I could. And, you know, all the gigs that I really wanted, everybody was either from New York or L.A., in my case. Um, so I had to make the move. And uh, 11 years ago, I moved from uh, from uh, Hollywood, Florida to New Jersey and, you know, to take my shot, you know, at, at the big city. So uh, I've been here and that's where I started off, you know, doing the, the videos and, you know, social media started to really kick in when I moved here. And I mean, what's, you know, a better, more picturesque place for showing, you know, concerts and where, you know, what you're doing than, you know, here in New York City. So um, it was cool to just share all the places, you know, that I was, you know, dealing with, you know, when I first moved into New York City and just really just seeing how I wanted to use social media. And that was how I came up with just only, I only post about my career on social media. I I don't really, I don't get personal with it. Um, It's just easier that way. It's not, it can get a little messy when you have your, your opinion about something, unless it's something that you do. And that's part of your brand. But, um, during those years is when I was like, okay, I'm only gonna, I just want it to be about what I'm doing and, and like show, like document all the different gigs. That's how I take my post as, but then when people, you know, Google me, you know, not even thinking about that earlier when I first got into, uh, doing social media, like, oh, this also goes to your Google account <laughs> and, you know, the keyword and your face and just like pe- when people look for you, because people will, people always Google people. So, Lena, you know, what's their name? OK, let me look up what's going on. And uh, you want to be able to control that narrative. And 
that was a, a, a big thing for me. I, I really wanted to be able to showcase, you know, my, my best material and where I was at production wise at the time. And it was great because you also saw me get better and better throughout those years. I mean, my two track recordings from, you know, eight, nine years ago to the multi track uh, 96K recordings I've done for Christian um, in Europe, you know, uh, with, with a travel kit uh, that's day and night. <laughs> so, and, and I love seeing that, that, that flow. So um, that that's the big thing about you know always taking something from the 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 opportunity that I got with Christian. Then I was like, hey, can he was like, yeah, record everything I do live. So now I have this huge library of live recordings from a six-time Grammy Award winner with I mean, just like the lead singer from Earth, Wind, and Fire, right? You know, just like. <laughs> all these different people, Jeffrey Osborne, like all these people I grew up um, listening to and now getting to mix them and record them live. And um, all of that came from putting out what I I already was passionate about doing um, in the first place. So um, I, I really push people to do that. And also, you know, always look out on how you can help other people um, service, uh, <laughs> through a friend of a friend ended up getting, uh, at the time Beyonce's production manager's number. And I had just moved to New York, but I knew I had nothing to offer because <laughs> I was like, I was like six, uh, you know, I was only like eight or nine years out of, you know, audio school and I had no real, you know, credits yet. So, you know, I was like, hi, I'm an audio engineer in New York City. She lived out in L.A. And she was like, oh, OK, that's cool. I, you know, I know a lot of engineers. I was like, oh, okay, I know. <laughs> uh, but I was like, yeah, you know, um, I'm around now. Um, funny thing, I ended up losing that phone with her number in it. And then this is what also showed me the power of social media, Somehow, I guess because I, I did have her information at one time, I ended up finding her on uh, LinkedIn. <laughs> and at the time, LinkedIn had their Twitter account. You could see people's Twitter from their LinkedIn account. And I was looking at her Twitter and I saw that her sister was doing a show. Her sister was a singer. Um, and at the time, I was working at Claire. Uh, Claire Global, they had a, a broadcast wireless um, set up. So I, I was like, hey, if you need anything for your sister setup, please let me know. We, you know, we got all the top stuff here. You know, she was like, oh, OK, yeah. And she let me know what she needed. I got it for her, brought it to the, the show, set it up for her. Everything went great. I ended up, you know, meeting Beyonce's uh, playback live playback guy. So all those live DVDs, you see quizzes work. He's a good friend of mine. Um, I ended up meeting him who also ended up putting me on to getting endorsements for that. I'm now a retailer for, for, you know, brands like Focus Right, uh, Lewitt Microphones, which you see right here. This is their, their two microphones uh, that we have in our studio. Uh, and focus right from their Claret to Scarlet stuff, which we're now selling for our podcast kit. So to take that of just, you know, just helping someone out when I knew that they needed help to now it, it's even helped me become a retailer of the stuff that I, I was using at full sale. I never would have thought I would end up selling gear, but now, um, through networking and, you know, be doing things for people and just, just helping out, being of service. I'm not saying be a, a kiss ass or anything, but don't be a headache to people when they see you coming. When they see you coming, you want them to be like, oh, okay. <laughs> um, so all of that is from me not knowing anybody really 
But it was just always putting my best foot forward and always thinking about what's next. You know, that that's always, you know, in my mind of like, okay, how do we, you know, how, how do I take this situation and who's not doing this or, you know, it's really reading the trends that are going on in what you do and what may be next. And then when you hop on something that's starting to take off and you're one of the early pioneers of it, which is kind of what I'm doing now with, (laughs) with podcasting, um, that's a better position than being, you know, coming in 40, 50 years, you know, into something that if, if you don't have a connection to it, it's so much harder to get into. Like a lot, like live sound. It's a very incestuous, like, you know, um, father, son, and like uh, of who is, is doing what, you know, it, it's a, it's very family oriented, especially up here in New York with the unions and stuff. It's a lot of cousins and you're like, oh, okay. <laughs> Everybody knows each other. And it's a little bit harder for somebody who's not in the know or not in that family. So, you know, th- those are a few of the stories that kind of, you know, that changed my life. And oh, also, I also want to, um, give a shout out to just the the community here you have at Full Sail. Um, really use it. Uh, you know, your classmates now are, are the next big thing. You just got <laughs> um, uh, the, the guys I, I went to school with. I mean, you know, one guy, he's the Eddie. He does all of Rick Ross's stuff, all the classic stuff that Rick Ross did. Um, I he just, he even did um, Megan the Stallion's um, Savage, the original mix. He was a mixer on that, and he was my he's my homie. Actually, he came to my Hall of Fame, and you know, just the people are around you, you and you can tell who really wants it and hang out with those people, um, and, and, and be of service and help out. And when you have an idea, they'll stop everything to make it happen, and. And that's been a a, a a a saving grace for just like all the years <laughs> and all the grind, you know, to get to the the, the next level. So, um, yeah, uh, I think I'm ready for for any questions too. All right. Well, we definitely have some questions coming in. So I'll I'll start with the first few that have come through. Um, Fernando has asked, I'm friends with some pretty well-known people in the rap industry, but don't want to sound like just another fan asking for a collaboration. And so he's wondering what can he do to stand out from the crowd so that the bigger artists will want to work with him? Ooh, uh, it's not about the bigger artists. It's about the upcoming artists. You, You need to concentrate more on what's next. The big guys, hey, if you get it popping with the little guy first, the big guys will come calling. So that that's pretty much how that goes. But it's easier to get to the ones on the rise. So that's why I'm like, you really have to watch trends and whatever you're doing, whether it's producing, engineering, whatever, game design. You really have to think about, okay, who's coming up next? Who's trending? Who's who's constantly putting out the content? that people are like starting to, to get into. So. Excellent insight and very, very accurate and on point too. I think what so many uh, other hall of famers have said as well, right? Just like do the work, get it out in front of people and continue to stay on top of that research. So Bernadette is asking, how would you suggest crafting a LinkedIn for someone interested in changing careers to enter the entertainment industry. And in Bernadette's case, that's writing. Uh, I would start a writing series that would make me have to write every week. And then I would post it up in the, uh, I forget what they call that section. There's like a article 
and you, you and, and just put it out there. Your takes on what's next in your world or, you know, whatever artist, but have as many samples of your writing out there as possible um, and, and, and curate everything towards that. Your bios, everything, just a writer. You may even, you know, have in your job, but it may not even be in your headline, but make it very plain <laughs> that you're a writer. Excellent insight and probably um, <clears throat> do some, again, you're probably going to hear me mention this word research a lot, everyone today, the participants, uh, where are other writers that are in that same genre, that same idea, posting that information uh -huh. and put it in that area as well. And that it's, it's a networking idea. And I want to point out, because we were chatting just a little bit in the chat box about the LinkedIn learning videos that students have, thousands of LinkedIn videos available to them. And you mentioned something that I thought was really important. And we sometimes don't talk about it enough. And that was analytics do matter. And so anyone uh -huh. who, right, anyone who might have heard that and said, well, I don't know much about analytics, LinkedIn learning, boom, we're coming up into holiday break, guys, what a great time to kind of dive into some of those social media analytics videos mm -hmm. to, to be able to make that connection that has been so successful for, for Fela. So oh, yeah, another, and, and to hop on that a little bit more, it's just like, <laughs> it lets you see how many people look at your writing like do you see it spike with a certain thing that you wrote that I mean that's just analytics that's it just basics I'm not talking about like <laughs> doing ads yet but that could be something that could you know comes down the line which we we do but yeah it, it's just seeing what works that you do yep. a trend right I mean it, mm -hmm. it guides us I love that yeah Okay, Ivana says or asks, um, was there any specific strategy that you started to use in your LinkedIn profile that was effective later on that you would recommend? Uh, adding pictures, adding media to every, you know, to everything that you do. If there, you know, if there's an article on something that you worked on that was like. Maybe not even an article, but putting as much content about what you do as you can, you know, mm -hmm. is, and or and creating it yourself, like what I told her to do to you know write. I mean, I started me and my business partner. We started our our podcast like three years ago, just to get into the rooms with the people that we wanted to get in the rooms with, and nobody else bothered it us. You know, because when you're in an interview, you have to be very, you know, square into what, you know, whatever, you know, what's going on. So, you know, what I'm saying, rather, or what the interviewer is saying. So definitely, you know, do stuff that puts you with who you want to get to. And because and, they, they're usually always down to, to answer questions, but also be able to archive it as well. I mean, I think it's just good for everybody for that. Yeah. And with our project and portfolio courses too, especially those are maybe towards the end of their degree program, that work you're producing, that is the type of stuff that you can put into the LinkedIn to create that visual aspect. Because I think we all go a little slower when we get to see a visual image or something there that catches our eye. So, exactly. Yeah. And that, add that little bit of motivation too, to getting that assignment done because if you do it top notch you can you can yeah get it for the learning and for yeah, the grade of course and right the content of it yeah <laughs> and the LinkedIn. yeah okay. all right we have an anonymous who says uh, or is asking would you say that someone can become masterful in multidisciplinary pursuits like music producing animation and screenwriting not sure if my output would be as high quality without focusing on just one but I want to pursue and post about different areas. So for that student who kind of wants to be in a few different spaces, how should they decide maybe where to hone in on? Or do you recommend focusing a little bit on all those areas? I got really good at audio first. I think you have to be masterful at one thing first. I can do it in my sleep. 
<laughs> um, and then I started doing adding in the video and the editing and, and stuff like that. That came in within the last like six, seven years. So yeah, I, I suggest mastering something first because then the clout that you make you got you get off of mastering this one thing, it gets you in the doors of other things. Well said. We have lots of questions. I love this. Okay. <laughs> so Lewis is asking, what was your experience from day one, to the last day at Full Sail? And did your path change during that journey? During during my Full Sail journey? Uh, mm-hmm. Yes. Well, <laughs> it's funny. Well, I, it came back. I I went there for recording arts. I mean, at the time, it was only the associate's um, st- um, degree. And I came for um, studio and the third, third or fourth month in, I ended up taking the live sound course and I fell in love with it. So I initially thought I, you know, first four months, I thought, yeah, studio. Uh, and then I fell in love with, with the, the live aspect. And then I fell back in love with it because now, you know, we're in my studio now. <laughs> so, but it all came from, going on the road, but also recording the whole thing that got me on LinkedIn and got me, you know, a little bit more noticed um, was the recording aspect, which has now put me back into the studio and, and I'm loving it. So good to hear. Um, One question that I think is heavy on all of our hearts and minds these days, Catherine is asking in this COVID world, do you think it's still important to be in one of the big cities? Uh, no, I mean, that, that's the fantastic thing I love about podcasts. Um, I, I would, if I was leaving full sale now, I could start a podcast business in my small town and be able to like go to the other, uh, towns around and just go to businesses and, and be, you know, sell this as a marketing tool to them. Like nobody else is really doing it. so. It's so many more opportunities with the internet being on a thousand million compared to when I first got out of full sale. So, um, yeah, with the internet being such a, a game changer from when I even uh, graduated, no, it, it kind of depends on what you want to get into, though. If you could craft something that does let you stay in a smaller town and you enjoy that, I, I'm, I would be down for that. If, if, if that was a possibility then, I mean, because you basically have a business once you leave out of full sale. You have your Scarlet's, you have a whole setup. <laughs> I mean, you have a, a laptop. Like, that's all you need to start a podcast business. You could do that straight out of school. So it kind of just depends on what you want to concentrate on. If you're going to do live sound, and do major shows, you have to go to a major city. But I mean, that isn't going to happen probably for another year for that to really, or two, you know, I mean, with everything that's happened. So it's really about crafting your career and where you want to take it. And probably too, just taking this time, if you do want to go, like you said, into life sound, right? Mm -hmm. How if let's, you know, I'm not going to, even you saying possibly two years, right? Hurts the, yeah, my, I know. my concert <laughs> heart. But um, yes. But, but what can we do now in this one year? If that's where we know we want to go, but we possibly know that's you know that life sounds not going to happen right away. What can we do now so that when it does start back up, because it will, uh, how yeah. can I be ready? For it, right? I mean, if if it's audio, you you learn other aspects of audio is always going to help you uh, to the next thing. Uh, I, you know, I can mix audio with video, live, music in the studio, all because, I mean, I love audio. I, you know, I wanted to know all the aspects and it kind of pushed me. It depends on, depended on where I was at in my life um, to learn all the aspects anyway. Because, yeah, I, you know, as I told the story earlier, um, okay, I'm working at House of Blues, but it's seasonal and that was it. 
So I had to get another job. So I ended up working at CBS news station and, you know, learning more about cameras and, and mixing audio live for broadcasts. So, you know, I, I had to adjust for that. I mean, really the other thing about, um, when I graduated, that was the year that the hit factory in New York City closed. And I was like, oh and 9-11 happened. So <laughs> I was like, oh, OK, uh, that that this industry is about to be gone. Like I already knew once hit factory, which was like the the. The mega that that was the mm-hmm. one of the end all be alls in, in in recording studios and it was gone. I was like, okay. And now I mean there's just so few New York City um uh studios here now. I mean, especially if it takes up a lot of room or have the the high ceilings that give you the epic, you know, the Frank Sinatra recordings and stuff mm-hmm. like that. That's now condos. So yeah. You just have to adjust. This it's always going to be something going on. I love that adjusting. Zachary's question lines up right with this. Zachary's asking, "Would freelancing be the best choice for right now?" Yes, freelancing you should always have going. I I never stopped freelancing. Even I was working at you know at Claire, but I was doing I was doing warehouse stuff, but I. I wanted to mix, you know, I, I was going to make it happen and I, I couldn't get let that get rusty. So always do your passion, even, you know, to just, you know, get your foot in the door somewhere else. But I mean, I also worked at, at Claire because I knew once you work there, I would never have to look for a job again. Like I knew I could go to any sound company in the country or probably pretty much the world after working, even working at Claire, I mean, I knew how, you know, everything worked, the, the boards, the, you know, the, the line arrays, everything. So, you know, and the advanced teaching that you get when you're at a place like Claire, it's worth taking a, a pay cut just to learn. I mean, I, I'm so glad I did do it because it was very hard because I mean, you're in New York city and they're paying like $10 an hour. It, it like <laughs> in a warehouse. Uh, but I'm so glad I went through that because I learned everything that I needed to know for that LinkedIn opportunity. Once he was like, oh, you know, we're going to be going around the world. I was fine with that because I had seen every console on the market at Claire for that $10 an hour, but now I'm getting the 10X that going out on the road. So, but you need to know how to do it before you get there. You can't be, you know, I mean, that's, I would like to know how to do it. Sometimes, you know, you got to fake it till you, you know, not fake it till you make it, but you really have to like rely on the basics of what you know of audio to get you through. And usually that can get you through, but mm-hmm when you're already ready from a place that, you know, really I'm checking all the boards that were coming from like Beyonce or Good Morning America and seeing how they EQ'd and what they used, it it changed my life and like how I I even went about mixing and, you know, like what mics to use and taking the mics from Claire and using them at my my cheap gig, the the fifty dollar mixing gig, but I got to be a better mixer from that. So always learning and always getting better, and that made me excited, even though I was darn near sleep deprived going from <laughs> Claire from nine to five, and then mixing like seven to one, and then going back to Claire, and yeah, it, you know. But I needed that for at least a year, and it was worth it. Right. Everything was you developing your skill, yeah. laying it on top of another laying it, it never to you was like, oh, I'm just doing this for now. You're like, I'm doing this. I'm going to learn from it. Oh, yeah. and I'm going to move forward. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I've never gotten fired from a place. I always just leave like once I, I, I'm not learning anymore and I'm always looking for gigs. That's just what I'm going to do. So, <laughs> you know, it, it's it's. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So that's how that happened. Yeah. Yeah. 
Mark is asking, and this question's come up a few times, do you recommend utilizing several different platforms at the same time, like Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube, or focusing in on just one of them? Um, I, I, yeah, I focus on like a, a couple myself, uh, LinkedIn, Instagram, Facebook, um, and all for different reasons and who looks at what. Um, Facebook is for the older crowd, but the older crowd has money. <laughs> and they're the ones who own businesses. And that's what I'm looking for as a podcast studio. Um, I do a lot of independent podcasting here. So, you know, we go out and we'll, you know, we have doctors, lawyers, all types of people, uh, sports podcasts coming through here. So everybody is a possible client. So that's, you know, that's, that's pretty. And what was the other the part of the question? What Just, Would you recommend that they, or they only focus in on one social media channel? Yeah, like I said, so with Facebook, I know from like 35 and up, that's their territory. Instagram, a little younger. Um, and then LinkedIn are more business owners. Um, I haven't really... I haven't really done anything on TikTok. Um, I haven't, yeah, we haven't messed with that yet at all. So yeah, for me, it's been concentrating on those three and just like really zeroing in on it. And um, yeah, and people reach out to me all the time through those those DMs, you know? So uh, I just ended up getting, uh, I'm a, started writing for Pro Sound uh, News's podcast letter. So my first um, article just came out a couple of weeks ago. Um, but that was through LinkedIn. <laughs> uh, the, the editor uh, at LinkedIn, um, I, I sent him an invite to my, my page, my podcast studio page. And he was like, oh, would you be interested in writing? And it just went from there. So putting out there what you're doing and inviting people. And when they see that you're doing stuff, it, it just, it works out. Yeah. And it's easy to see too. You, you really understand which, why you're using each channel. You're not just like, I like Instagram. So I'm going to be on Instagram. You've really yeah. like, <laughs> yeah. been very specific, which is smart. You're running a business. So that makes yeah. sense. We have a question from Chelton, and he's saying, I'm looking to do an EP with himself, he's a bassist, and vocals. Each single would feature a different artist or other musician. Is there any advice that you have on approaching this endeavor? Oh, um, sounds like a cool endeavor. Um, just, yeah, getting everybody that you uh, invite in to reshare and you know hopefully growing the you know growing what you have going on but you know that's just one of many projects that you're going to be doing <laughs> so you know it's just like okay what's going to be after that and then what's going to be after that and what's going to be after that is is you know and don't expect like a bunch of views because for me, it's never been about having 10,000, 30,000 views. It's it's one set of eyes that can change your life. So everybody, don't get caught up in the numbers. It, it's the it's the one set that, that can really change your, your whole world. So, um, you know, good luck with the project, but, you know, keep it keep it going. What you're going to do, in, you know, after that and after that and after that is asking she says hi you're very informative and she thanks you for your time she wants to know um, she has deleted all of her social media two years ago and it's and it's helped her for the better it's been a positive for her mm -hmm. but she's afraid once she gradu graduates she won't have the extra support from people to build a reputation so does deleting your accounts really affect her presentation? Should she try to go ahead and maybe get on some social media channels? What advice do you have for her? Oh, like I said, 
10 years ago, I decided just to always put my my work stuff up. I I have no personal stuff on, on my pages. I, I tend to share from my business page. So just, just use it as a work tool. It, it doesn't have to be an emotional thing um, to get wrapped up in. It, you can just use it to grow what you want it to grow with. Um, it's way too many um, great possibilities out there not to have a social media presence. Uh, and it's also just how people look for you. I mean, all those posts and stuff, that shows up on your Google accounts and on your YouTube and stuff like that. Um, that's that's very important uh, as selling tool for anybody right now. So you want to you really want to take care of that. And I I'll even say this: um, like my first name is, is a Fela, which is also another um, very well known <laughs> Nigerian saxophonist. So when I first started, you know, looking at Google and it was like 13 pages of, uh, well, I mean, it just hundreds of pages actually of this guy, Fela Kuti. So it was like, how will I even like break through? Um, but that was how it happened. It was just how you eat an elephant one bite at a time or one picture at a time, one video I edited it. And now I've looked up and now we've done hundreds of videos and, you know, uh, a bunch of, of podcasts and now we're doing podcasts for other people. So it's just a uh, slow and steady to build up. Courtney is asking, I believe keeping up with the trends is trends is challenging is it possible to run a successful business, promote your brand by dropping content that keeps your audience attention, but may only be once a week situation, kind of like doing pop up on your audience? And I think this question too, which is one that's popped up is, what is your uh, social media scheduling process? Do you yeah. have one? What do you recommend? Uh, I, I actually don't. I, we do it for so many other people. <laughs> a lot of the times, uh, actually, I, I have a um, a full cell alumni, uh, Kasim. <laughs> He's my uh, that that's been doing our behind the scenes and like posting for us. Um, now I get a lot of tags just from other from the other stuff that we are working on as well. Um, but for you. To, you know, starting out, yeah, you need a consistent thing that gets you excited to put out every week. It, it shouldn't be a drag. It should be something that you're like, oh man, every week I'm gonna I'm gonna twist it this way. Oh no, I'm gonna do a little, you know, see what works, see how many, you know, if you get more views with this thing or that thing. Make it fun. It is the biggest advice. I all, all the stuff that we've worked on and created, which our podcast was first a video series that was like three to five minutes. And we featured people like Leslie Ann Jones, uh, you know, head of audio at, at Skywalker and um, a couple other like heavy people. But it was just too much on the video aspect of editing and getting it all together. So we ended up turning it into podcasting because it didn't become affordable until like three, four years ago. Um, so, and, and then that finding the trends and you know how I found out about podcasting be, being affordable was going to a full sale mixer <laughs> five years ago. And I talking to, um, um, Amon focus um, about his podcast. And I was like, well, isn't that expensive? He was like, oh no, just there's a bunch of publishers. And so talking to people, that's reading the trends, finding out what other people are doing and, you know, having meaningful conversations, you know, like what's going on and what they're doing. So him telling me about that. And then like a couple of weeks later, we started our own podcast. So, you know, listen to what's going on the streets. 
can make those connections, right? That networking. We mm-hmm. have a question question from Ebony. It is when it comes to freelancing, how do you set your prices so that you aren't over or under charging for your time and work, especially maybe when you're um, recently out of school? Ah, uh, well, when you're recently out of school, you should be just doing it damn near for free. Like, hey, thanks. You're going to pay me? This <laughs> is. That shouldn't be, it it should be all about learning because you don't have a background to prove anything, any kind of pay yet. Uh, So really, your first few years will have to be learning. But to get ahead of that a little bit, you should just stalk other other pages or other people that do what you do. And they'll have their services up and, you know, just see where they're at geography wise, you know, why and OK, are they in Kentucky or are they in New York or are they in L.A.? Because those are all going to be different prices. So um, finding out, yeah, what's going on, the trend, that's another trend. How much does it pay? So knowing what the trend is and not, you know, trying not to be underpaid or, you know, or I mean, it's always good to be overpaid. So. <laughs> yes, yeah, right. Another question. We we have probably six minutes left, but we're gonna maybe move through this. I'm gonna try to give them to you fast too. We got lots of questions still coming through. Really exciting. So right. Latanya is asking, you mentioned um she says you mentioned something with Beyonce, but a guy I graduated with, Latanya saying, is a very well known actor. Last time he was in town, he gave me his number and agent's number, but I lost it. What do you think is a non- fancy professional way to try and reconnect, reconnect with him. So they met them, lost the contact information and wants to reach out to them again. What should they do? Uh, For me, I wanted to reach out with help in some way. So I, I, we were following each other and she knew who I was by then. Uh, You know, we were connections, um, But I just, you know, seeing what was going on in her life, you know, just kind of like looking at how you can help out. That that's the main thing on on like why you want to look at certain people's feeds is like, how can you help? How can you get that foot in the door? Maybe you do something that they may need, you know, and and you're able to help with and that's the foot in the door and then you're not even having to fight for for your job from somebody else because he just they that person just needed it. Um, say hello, but have something to bring to the table if you want more, you know, to push the relationship forward. Excellent insight. And that would go along too with anyone in the chat box who's asking about mentorship or creating a relationship with someone. That insight she just gave definitely transfers over to that exact situation too. Uh, Brian is asking, before podcast, did you have a specific niche that you targeted to get mixing audio work or did you take anything that came your way? Oh, no, I was very targeted. I want to be a front of house engineer and just, you know, do the biggest shows possible. Like that was coming out of full sail, the thought process. Like I want to get out on the road and, I, you know, strategically moving towards it. Like I ended, you know, House of Blues ended up leaving, you know, well, it, the season was out. So I ended up having to, uh, you know, go into working for CBS and ESPN radio. Uh, But I knew I still wanted to do live sound and I knew I was going to get back into it Um, about a year. And and I was going to move at that time, like even to Vegas, I I thought I was going to move to. But I ended up getting those two jobs and I stayed another year. But a friend of mine at the CBS station was moving to to South Florida. And she was like, Hey, I need a roommate if you're down. And, you know, it was like, what do I have to lose? And I had such a great time when we visited, you know, South Florida is just amazing. So (laughs) I I, I was on, you know, it was, it was on. Um, And I could learn. Uh, It it was like, okay, let's go from here. 
you know, where can we go next? Zachary is asking, how much time did you spend on mastering audio a day? And I'm going to kind of also add to that. How much time did you spend honing in on your craft? Honing? Oh, yes. Every day. Uh, Especially once I hit New York and I knew I was concentrating, you know, on the live sound and getting out on tour and and working with the biggest artists uh, I could. It was working at every bar, everything. It. You know, every night I was out seven nights a week. Uh, And then for a year of that working, you know, at at Claire during the day. So we're talking about a whole year, just sleep deprivation. That was probably one of the, (laughs) it was the most rewarding, but like the hardest year of my life. But I knew what I was learning and I knew that what the information I could take from Claire once I got my foot in the door there I would never have to worry about getting a gig and you have to kind of know where are those places that once you work there, everybody is going to, is open to hiring. So, you know, that gave me a, I I felt free actually once I was able to work at at Claire and then I'll leave, you know, on my own terms and, you know, without being asked, <laughs> but, um, uh, but, you know, learning what I could and then just saying, okay, after this, I, I went from working at Claire and I was still mixing every day, but I mean, I went even harder. I was mixing every day and then I was recording those two track recordings, touching those up. So that's when I got back into studio, like recording and kind of like listening in a room that, you know, what I, you know, what I initially got into this for. So, you know, it was just growing from what was next. I'll always like, okay, I'm just going to concentrate on this and I'm going to start posting online. And that was that weirdly enough, I was just like, I'm going to concentrate on this and I think it's going to work. And it did. Um, because nobody else was doing it. And I, and I just realized that. And again, actually, I want to say that I also got that thinking from a book called Think and Grow Rich, Napoleon Hill. Um, mm-hmm. I, I just, I gave myself no outs and I said, okay, I'm going to do it this way. And I kind of just went at it no matter what and just, you know, disciplined myself to it. So. Excellent. It is five o'clock. If- we're, we can continue to move through some questions if that's okay, okay with I'm, you. We still I have can. a bunch if, uh, okay. if that works. I want to just point out to, for anyone who might be needing to leave at five, you know, you've said some really important themes throughout today that are really important. Your knowledge about your industry is, is you can just see it in everything that you say, which I think really goes to the amount of research that you did as a student after you graduated and you really knew what to do. Uh, you also too like so many Hall of Famers, and I just think it's a great to see this attribute in all of you. You all um, really kind of leave school, and you really go at your craft for a really long time. You know, like you said, sleep deprivation was very real. It was something that happened to you, and I know so many Hall of Famers too have talked about that. So that's obviously a trait that is in all of you. That is one of the reasons why you're Hall of Famers. Too. Yeah, and and so it's not that you're going to, it's not that you're going to do that forever, but it's like certain opportunities though, you do want to take that. And I knew mentally it was going to be just a year. I wasn't going to stay longer. So you, you really just like, okay, if I can get my mind around it and it's do it, I haven't had to do that since, but it, it sticks in my head, but it, it, that's not it you know, don't, don't get scared by it. Like that's not how I still live. So. (laughs) Yeah. It's a a short amount of time, right? Yeah. Um, (laughs) Anna is asking, what would you say is the best option to start a podcast related to the music industry? Uh, That depends on, on your interest. Um, it was like, okay, let's do this thing called, uh, the art of music tech. It kind of hit everything. We like the art of it, like the best equipment because it's all custom and handmade. 
stuff and it's just it's an art piece <laughs> and then music and that's what me and my business partner are that's what we're into you know is mi- business and uh, music and you know tech this every putting it all together the beautiful sound and the music and so what makes you excited like that like what are the the things that that you want to put together and give your take on that people want to hear. Yes. Anthony's asking, um, Anthony's a musician who enjoys making beats, specifically lo-fi beats, and would like to make music for games and movies. Is there any tips to help him get started in his career? Hey, make make three beats a day and pit it to music, uh, pit it to, to, to movies you like of your own music. It's fit out as much as you can. Like, make it very clear you're lo-fi to, to video what you do. That don't, don't make anybody have to guess about it. So, advice. Sean is asking, how would I go about charging people for playing on their tracks? Since everything is being done online, they want to do a partnership deal and copyrights. What type of contract should be drawn up since it's virtual? And he doesn't mind collaborating uh, work from time to time to get the experience. He wants to collaborate. Mm-hmm. Um, I, you may, you, you want to get with a lawyer on that. <laughs> um, and yeah, it kind of depends on, you know, who's the, um, who's the client and, you know, if, yeah, that that just kind of depends on where where everybody's at. Um, if it's Atlantic Records, then you're gonna deal with it definitely. You know, with with lawyers and and it kind it kind of depends on where where everybody is at in the situation. So, mm-hmm. yeah, uh, yeah, that's more of a lawyer question too. So, yes, we have a question from an anonymous uh, participant. They said. I'm not sure what skills are needed nowadays for music producers. How do you know if you're actually ready to work in the industry? Oh, you never know. <laughs> you just uh, you're just doing what you like and getting better at it every day, um, and sticking with it. it. It's really about okay. Is that's what you want to do? then you do something about it every day for years. So that, that's, that's pretty much it. Uh, Honor is asking, how do I become more disciplined? And does it get easier to become disciplined? Uh, you know what? I like to uh, read a lot of biographies. So it makes, when you read people's biographies, it makes them very human. Um, but then you also see the discipline side. Um, some things you may not be as disciplined at, but the things that you can, which is getting out a piece of content that you love, that you've done every week, be disciplined on that. Maybe it won't be everything in your life, but you have to be disciplined about certain things and getting used to that. Um, a lot of that came too for me. I used to play sports. Um, so I would, you know, I played basketball. I I was in marching band. I was in track and stuff. And it it was always about tracking what was going on around you. Who's the fastest? What's the time? It shot put or long jump or whatever. What's the length? What do I need to beat? You just need to, what's, what's going on in the top of the top? And where do you need to get to that? Where are you at and how you need to get to that level? Pretty much is, is, is the discipline for me. It's like, oh, okay, I do 1,500 jump shots. Uh, I'm going to get better. <laughs> so yeah. you, you do it as much as you can. And, and, and it, it's, it's going to happen. It's just, I mean, that's faith, but... It's just going to happen. You do anything a bunch of times, you're going to get better at it and you're going to be at the master level of it. Absolutely. 
A lot of uh, everyone who's kind of asking about the questions, like they want to grow their business, what should they do? And I, I really think we've, we've, you know, the idea of research, diving into that research, producing work as much as possible and getting it to the audience is really how you're going to be able to kind of grow your business, grow your social media content. We have a question from Jacob and he says, uh, where do you turn to when your creativity or your, fa- your passion feels stunted or drained? Hmm. Um, yeah, I don't really, <laughs> I, the only time I, I I felt drained was when I was working for other people. <laughs> that, mm-hmm. Like that was, um, since doing my own thing. And that's why I also like freelancing. It made it fun. And it, it, I never, yeah, I I get to use my own cre- creativity. I just when I feel stunted, it's usually from some other outside entity that's like stunting what what I feel like I'm doing. But um, man, I always I always feel like it, it's my brain, and nobody else can get in here but me. I I get to go anywhere I want to in the world in this in this brain. Nobody needs to know. I can always be cooking up the next idea or, you know, again, I like to read biographies and hearing what the best have done and the stuff that they went through and how they're human. And it just always made, it always gave me a sense of comfort um, knowing that. So that, that was, you know, and so my my creativity just always continues. Oh, I also walk every day. I tend I, I take like an hour long walk. And for me, if I do feel stunted, I have to go for a walk then and just let my mind wander. I may even have in music or a podcast, but I, I can still let my my mind wander or don't have in anything. Just when you let your mind just just go, the the ideas start to come in. So, and when I do feel like that or anything close to that, I'll take a walk and just let my mind go free. And then something will something will come in and be like, oh, why don't you try this? Or why, you know. The, why don't you? Yeah, it's always an idea when I when I get out of that some kind of movement. Mm-hmm. What I love is that you know what it is that you need to do or why you might be in that place to really think about you. You are very in touch with yourself. So if you're there, you're like, I'm going to go for a walk, or I know that yeah. I'm not in charge of what I need to do. So that's really powerful information you have at your fingertips. Oh yeah, and again, that that was listening to, to podcasts even before I started doing it, podcasts and biographies. I like that just made everybody human. Nothing is is beyond me. It feels like once you hear the backstory on how stuff happened to me, you know. So it's like, oh okay, I I, I think I could do that too. <laughs> made everybody human. <laughs> That's right. I'm an avid walker myself, so I really feel you on that one. Mm-hmm. Chelton is asking, what are your favorite consoles to use for live shows? Uh, all things DigiCo. <laughs> um, yeah, DigiCo is the it, it, end all be all. And, and that that's it. A lot of the, especially in Europe and a lot of the, the jazz venues and stuff, I, I, I get to mix on that a lot. Um, and Yamaha. I you know. Um, I just know how it works, so <laughs> it's, it's mm-hmm. an easy, easy console to get around. The the, the well, and that's really old. The five D PM five Ds, but yeah, the the um, the newer stuff, the the Rivage, the the PM ten, and yeah, all that kind of stuff. Loved it. A few people are also asking how they can get in touch with you after this session, maybe your social media channels or even the the um, blog posts that you had posted recently. I don't know if there's any of our moderators who might be able to post oh, up some yeah. of her links. Um, 
Pro- LinkedIn. LinkedIn. LinkedIn and Facebook. Actually, my, my personal IG, I just I haven't been on and I'm I'm horrible on that one. Um and I, all of my posts are really through my 23 DB Productions page or my one of one productions page. It's through my businesses on IG. But on Facebook, I, I'm on Facebook personally a lot. Uh, and through my business and LinkedIn as well. So yeah, reach out. And, and you can hear my my podcast, um, The Art of Music Tech. It's, it's on all the platforms, um, Apple, whatnot. And if you guys need uh, gear, even afterwards, check us out. We do all the focus right stuff. Like I said, um, we got merch, one of one. Nice. <laughs> so yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll check yeah, check me out on all those those platforms. Another question, is your home studio set up to mix and master or just record? Oh yeah, mix and master. Yeah. And and it, it this isn't a home, this is actually a a a, a studio business suite we have um right off the GW bridge. Which nice. at night we get to record music, but during the day we just do podcasting. So it's it's cool to be able to multi, you know, have multi use in the room and not, you know, if we were just doing music, we would have to be closed all day. But um, but yeah, the 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 podcast business is taking off so much. So another question. Um how do you get good, strong guests for your podcast show? And this is from Stuart. Uh, oh, go to conventions. <laughs> I go to AES, NAM, uh, all of that stuff. The networking that goes down, the people you get to meet. Um, even if you do like an interview on the spot, you know, <laughs> you know, whatever, like, it, you know, those types of places, people are just really open to do stuff. Um, but I knew a lot of people through touring and doing stuff that I had been doing for years and all of the engineers and stuff. And as you're out, you know, in the wild doing this kind of stuff, uh, you get to know people and, you know, and, and you take advantage of of getting to know them. I actually also had joined uh, this organization called Sound Girls, which was started by another uh, Hall of Famer, Michelle Sobolchik. Mm-hmm. So, um, yeah. So through that through that organization, I actually we we got um, Atlantic Records as a as a client. We were doing like live recordings. We ended up. Uh, I met somebody at a networking event through at a live at a sound girls event in New York city. And she ended up hooking us up with uh, live recording, like different venues uh, for live nation. Uh, so ended up doing something for Atlantic records and then Atlantic records started calling us. So for, for any like live recordings that they needed. Um, mm-hmm. So stuff like that. You, you know, you never know who you're talking to and who's going to, you know, reach out again later. So Micah is also asking for a songwriter producer. What is essential to have in your portfolio? Songwriter, producer, those two things, <laughs> exactly what you call yourself. Uh, many produced tracks by you that, and that were also written by you. Um as much as you can. Um, I mean, if you, I listen to, I hear stories like, you know, Kanye doing, you know, three songs a day for three summers. And, you know, if, if you're not willing to do that, then how, how will you get on his level? So, you know, when I hear stats like that, it's like, okay, then that's where I got to do it at, you know, um, I, I ended up hearing like I went to a, a live swimming seminar with like Buford Jones, which he makes like the Purple Rain tour and stuff. <laughs> and he was like, record all of your shows, be able to prove what you did. And and once I heard him say that, it was like, oh, OK, then that's what I got to do. He's a master. 
he mixed for Prince. So <laughs> that's what I did. Like wherever the level is at, then you at least have to meet that. I'm not saying exceed that, but you have to do three songs a day for three years. Like, are you willing? Do you want to be at the Kanye level? If not, don't do the three songs a day. So. Jackie is asking a professional artist used me as a model in globally published uh, photography. Should I approach her about using her photos in my post and on my black blog or social media? Definitely. Definitely. That, n- without a question. And tag her and she'll love it. She'll get more people to see her stuff and yours and yeah. Or, or just re like if she posted it, like reshare. So she does get the views, but people see also you doing your thing but collaborating with other people. Like, people like to see that, too. Like, oh, you're not just doing your own thing. It's just, it's uh, you know, you have other people that you're working with. Another question for, from Raneem. I'm a computer animation student, and I'm following a creator of well-known cartoons. Um, would asking to create animations for him help with getting his work notice. I don't want to seem like a fan just doing fan work only, but I want people to know that there is also an an animator who can do that work. Uh, uh, Don't even, don't ask, just do. Because it may not be his set of eyes that change your life, but it could be another person that's like, oh, I, I really like that. So do it regardless. It doesn't matter. Just, just put out your best work forward and and get better than it with the next piece that you put out nice we'll do a few more questions sean has another one um given the art of music how do you feel about older amps like those used in the 80s music oh oh i mean i i love vintage stuff all day i mean i got a two mic right here so <laughs> so i mean i i love all things audio. I love all genres of music, like anything that has to do with gear. I, you know, I, I'm all about it. My my um my business partner Dennis, uh, he has a few amps. He's a, he's the producer uh, of of our of our business. So he he you know does the music for our op our podcast clients and stuff like that. So, oh yeah, we got plenty of gear all around. So I, I'm, I'm all about it. Got an analog synth too. Uh, this, this is pretty dope. <laughs> Thought you guys would like that one. <laughs> um, Sean coming in with another question. A piece of content every week might be difficult to do for a programmer. I'm guessing he's a, he's a programmer of some sort. And he says, so for those with careers and passions that have those longer production times, should we adjust our piece of content per timeline to fit or should we look for producing other sorts of content related to it? And I think he means kind of posting on social media or LinkedIn. Uh, yeah, uh, do it at the timeline that you can do it, but push yourself to keep it at that though. You know, that <laughs> you can be like, ah, I'll do it when I feel or like get to it. Like put yourself on a calendar, put yourself on the timer to do it. Um, and it, it just, you get quicker results that way. I find just putting yourself out there and, 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 and doing it once you say you're going to do it. Right. Who, is, this is questions from Jacob. Who is your biggest influencer or role model? Oh, it's, yeah, that, that that's like so many people. There is no, <laughs> there's no biggest, that's my, my parents, that they just let me do what I wanted to do. Uh, I they, I never had any pressure. Um, I was always a decent student, so they just let me do what I wanted to do, and I I really admire that because I realize that that doesn't happen, you know, a lot. Like I I just got to be in my own brain and not being pushed to do anything that I didn't want to do. Um, so that, that's been my biggest inspiration. If they they 
they, they were a little hands off and, and it worked out. <laughs> mm-hmm. Jacob is also asking, what is your thought process in the case, if you've ever experienced this, where the person you're collaborating with or creating for stops responding? What do you do with the content you've created with them or for them? Oh, they ghosted you on on doing a project pretty much? Is that what I'm hearing? Mm-hmm. That, yes. Hmm. I... That's interesting. I don't, I don't, uh, yeah, I guess I, I would use what was there if I could, uh, I would, but, um, I guess that wasn't meant to be, it, you know, um, if, if it is something that you, you think is dope though, I think you should finish it then, you know, um, it, it, this is just putting it out there as much stuff that you enjoy that you did, I'd say still put it out there. Fi- you know, figure out, um, take out the snippet that the other partner was on if you can. Like, try to figure out a way to repurpose is what I would do personally. Excellent advice. We have a question from an anonymous attendee. They said, I've actually met a presenter in the Hall of Fame that mentioned they were hiring. As someone without experience, I'm only on my third month of full sale. I assume it's something that I can't really hop on right now, but I don't want to blow my chance and feel like it could help me get a start. They sent me their website and contact info for everyone to read, but I'm not sure the best way to approach. Do I tackle this now? Do I wait? They may not be looking to hire, but is there anything I can do to get their attention and maybe get some advice or tutoring in the future? Uh, I'd suggest, uh, yeah, yeah, getting the relationship started, at least following each other. Uh, you want to get on their radar, but not be overwhelming and like, eh, you know, <laughs> cause we're, we're all dealing with so much going on between personal lives and business. So, um, and as you're doing stuff, be like, Hey, give me your opinion on this this thing I did, you know, I, I like to reach out to you and, you know, every so often, but keep it going. Like it's really a long game. <laughs> you know, it can be years, but that's the good, that's fine though, because this is such a finite amount of people in all of our industries, whether you're in gaming, audio, whatever. Um, you're going to see them again anyway, if they're staying in, in the game. So, um, I, I would, I would just continue to reach out and keep, you know, keep watering the, uh, the, the, the field on that and just, you know, continuing on. Cause I mean, yeah, we'll, we'll be hiring forever. Like, like as, as long as we're in the, you know, in doing what we're doing. So, um, yeah, just start the relationship up but mm-hmm. not be overwhelming. <laughs> it's, a, yeah. it's a fine balance though. I get it. You know, you're like excited and they're like, ah, I got a thousand other things going on. <laughs> mm-hmm. And I'm sure you've experienced this. This probably happens to you too, but um, you know, that anonymous, the question that came from that anonymous participant, they're only in their third month. So that means they're going to get to experience another hall of fame. So go ahead. Oh, like yeah. you said, water that <laughs> relationship. And then, then you get to meet with them. And then I know hall of famers. I mean, you do it too, right? You mentor the students and meet with the students. So it's about that relationship. So we are at time pretty much at this point. Okay. Um, if, if you have any one last piece of advice or insight you want to give everyone that is here, we will end on that. Oh, um, it, it, it's up to you. Everything that you want is up to you. Uh, and hey, you know, how do you eat an elephant to get to what you want? You, you do something every day towards that goal. Every day. This is just 18 years of eating that elephant. And that's how I got in front of you guys. So uh, good luck and can't wait to see you at the Hall of Fame one of these days. <laughs> Thank you so much, everyone. See you guys. Bye, everyone. Thank you Bye-bye. so much for being here. <laughs>